And that right there is the cue for your health on this Wednesday. If you're just joining us, you're right in time for today's segment. We're calling today's um, Your Health segment The Ugali Nation. We're going to take a look at nutrition here in Kenya in regards to the nation. And with me, as earlier announced, is Dr. Esther Dindi, as well as Kate Kibara. She's a clinical nutritionist, as well as colon hydrotherapist. Um, Ladies, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank and thank you for being here. Um, now, the thing with Kenyans and even Africans in general, we love our ugali. Oh, yes. uh, in, in Nigeria, it's called, uh, well, in Southern Africa, it's called pap. In, in Eastern Africa, we refer, refer to ugali. I can't remember the term that is used in Western Africa to be specific, Nigeria. But this is a staple food on the continent. It's something that we love. But the effects of starch is true and it's quite evident. But Dr. Esther, could you paint um, this out for us, the effects of too much starch? Uh, ugali is awesome. It is I, awesome. I think every other day I'll have some bit of ugali, <laughs> but I choose which kind of ugali to have. Uh -huh. It's true that as a nation we rely a lot on ugali and maize, and uh, probably this is because you can store maize. Once you dry it, there, there are many other processes, so it has a longer shelf life than other starches. Mm -hmm. But it's also good for Kenyans to realize that there are other options besides, besides just ugali and besides maize. But the, the issue is consuming too much starch. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as a phys physician who sees a lot of diabetics and hypertensives yeah. and and dyslipidemias these are conditions that are actually have been shown to be arising more from consuming a lot of starch mm. so the problem is not really consuming ugali is that we are consuming too much of it we are consuming less of vegetables we are less active and that becomes the problem so the overconsumption and also consumption of more refined ugali mm -hmm. you know some kind of ugali fly is more like wheat fly mm -hmm. you know so that is the problem so there's no problem consuming ugali I do consume ugali, and many people are healthy consume ugali. <laughs> it's the how much, how frequent, what are the portions, what are the proportions, what else are we consuming with it that actually matters. And we need to diversify our source of carbohydrates okay. as well. Okay, Dr. Ari, to a, man, to a layman's language, then yeah. how often should I eat my ugali in a week? You can eat it as frequently as daily, but it's when we, we, we say that it's good to diversify, it's because first we are running out, uh, you know, we are running out of maize, and we have food shortage right. sometimes, yeah. and in some areas like the arid and semi-arid, and um, so the problem is that we are relying too much on the ugali, so it's good to diversify. Mm. We can have sorghum, we can have millet, we can have yams, we can have sweet potatoes, and, and we can have uh, arrow roots. And why am I naming all this and they are actually carbohydrates? It's because when you vary your, your source of uh, carbohydrates, you also include some other nutrients because each food has some extra nutrients beyond the carbohydrates mm. per se. Mm. So it's good to vary them. And what you eat with the ugali matters a lot. Are you having your vegetables, whether green vegetables, colored vegetables, that matters a lot. And of course, protein, because your food should be balanced. So don't forget your healthy fats, don't forget your protein, don't forget your vegetables. They're the most important to ensure that you're, you're evening out your calories intake so you get satiety without consuming too much carbohydrates. I love that you said that it's also in regards to your balance because within the African um, tradition our culture it's ugali and nyama. Oh and that's a problem that's a problem. That's a problem? That's a problem. Kate as a as a colon hydrotherapist what does that do to one's body? One eating too much of starch and if you're not doing what Dr. Esther said the aspect where Yes, you're having your ugali, but you also have the vegetables and you have your, the good healthy fats. What does lack of that do to one's body? I think um, if you're not having enough nutrition, mm. uh, you end up, you know, your body needs to get nutrients every day. And mm. that's why you eat. You need to take your fats, like a doctor is saying, you need to take your carbohydrates, you need to take your proteins, you need to take your vitamins and minerals, and a, a little bit of the oils and sugars. But what we lack in is that we are eating one particular type of food, probably because it's easier, it's the fastest thing, it's the easiest thing that five minutes, 10 minutes, my ugali is ready mm. and I can make a little bit of vegetables, but not balancing it with other foods, like she's saying, means that you're denying some nutrients, micronutrients that your body may need for you to have energy, for your tissues to be repaired and rejuvenated, for your brain to be alert, for you to be alive. You require to take different micronutrients from the different foods. So if you're going to rely on our uh, usual ugali, uh, and nyama, choma throughout or beef throughout, it means that there are certain elements or nutrients that you're missing that could be very important. Remember the ugali flour is already uh, polished. We actually remove the fiber and the fiber is roughage, which you actually require. It acts as a broom. Mm -hmm. We have both the soluble and insoluble fiber that helps with the absorption of nutrients and helps with the 
the digestion of what you're eating. So if you're going to rely on this nyama every time, you know, only beef which has less fiber or very little fiber, there is no uh, vegetables in your diet and vegetables are a rich source of both soluble and insoluble fiber. And then you have your ugali which has already been refined, polished, so nothing to ensure that this is digested where well or it comes out of your system, you end up with time having a sluggish uh, bowel or, or sluggish bowel movements, depending on how long this food will sit on your in, in your intestine. So for people who are not cautious, when goes to, when times when it's time to go to the toilet, that's that's they're in trouble. <laughs> they are in ideally, trouble. Ideally, if you're taking food that are not uh, too much solid foods, mm -hmm. if you're taking a lot of uh, fatty foods, a lot of uh, uh, high sugar foods, mm -hmm. you find and even food that are low in fiber, you find that you have a sluggish uh, bowel or right. sluggish metabolism. And while this is happening, you end up not having a regular bowel movement as it should be. You know, when you're eating, ideally, the nutrients are absorbed and the waste should come out immediately. So if it's taking longer than this, we have the disease that is caused by everything else, which is constipation. And when you're constipated, you find that all these other things will start developing because of that one small thing that was caused by only eating a particular food that either was not balanced or did not have, and especially the fiber aspect, uh, if we're discussing There's this. something that she said that is really quite important, Kate. So allow me mm -hmm. to divert just a little bit. After you've eaten the food, after you've eaten your food and your body extracts the nutrients that mm -hmm. it, it needs, whatever comes out is, is now um, the, waste. Waste. the waste. waste. Yeah. But how, it's after how long? Let's say the it, thing. <laughs> is it after three days? Is it after two days? So I know if uh, you know how things you, are okay. The way your digestive system is uh, is, is designed from right. your, all the way from your throat, all the way to your rectum. It means that in every 24 hours, mm -hmm. you should have at least two bio movements. Wait, every, <laughs> if you're taking three square meals I think in from a day. a medical standpoint, yeah. the interesting is that people can actually vary and be within normal. Uh -huh. yeah. but. Ideally, you should have a bowel movement at every least every day. day. Some people can have two bowel movements in, in, in a day. Others can have one and I even have three in a week and still be within normal. And actually, from a medical standpoint, it's very important to highlight that if you notice a change in your bowel habits, you need to consult. Okay. If your nutritional habits have not changed and you notice that you're taking too long to now empty your bowels or, or it's happening too frequently, those changes and the consistency, it, it's good to have your, yourself checked. It could be the first you know, warning sign that something is not going right. Kate, exactly. In fact, uh, death begins in the colon, in your Ooh. bowel. If you're not eliminating what you're eating, if your body is not absorbing the nutrients from the food that you're taking as well, it leads to serious conditions. There is a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so, Kate, there's this, um, I don't want to say it's a stereotype, but I've had it and I'm glad that you're here as nutritionists, that in the morning, that's the best time to go. And that's the advisable time to go. Yes. Uh, you know, when you wake up, um, your body system is active. Yes. And in fact, because a lot has been happening at night, it is good to have you know, at this Bowel particular time. in the morning. Yes, you but can most train of yourself. the time. Yeah, you can also train yourself. You can but train most of yourself. the time, if it's not happening at this time, maybe it also depends on your lifestyle. Maybe you ate very late, you're not eating three square meals, you're not drinking enough water. It's not only dependent on that particular time. But if you take something like a glass of warm water in the morning, it, really, it actually helps in the body to get rid of all those things that were happening when while you were sleeping, you know, the, 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 the cleansing of the system, the liver working and all those things, it's good to get rid of this time. And it's actually, if your body is trained at this time, you find that it happens naturally without thinking. And a bowel movement doesn't have to be in the morning, just that morning. It is something that is easy. It's something that you do not sit, you know, sometimes with a magazine for <laughs> half an hour, you're straining, it's a hard, no. It's something that should be easy because it is part of your body just getting rid of what was not needed at that time. Dr. Esther, um, I've diverted a little bit from the conversation here, but this is <laughs> quite interesting Ugali. because it's still nutrition. But you yeah. said something um, like we, you can train yourself, you can train your body. Yes, you How? can. Yes, you can. If you're consistent with your meal, say you have your breakfast, your lunch, your supper, and you can actually decide that you'd be taking your... You know, emptying your bowel in the morning. Mm. And, and if you make it habitual, it becomes very easy. You can train yourself. But I think one should not fuss over what time they actually do it. So I, I, so long as you, you, you're having your bowel movements a day, it, it should not be something that you're so stressed about. But if you're taking too long, like Kate said, a and, and you're constipating most of then that, that's a problem. Dr. Esther, what happens if... In the aspect of training your body, I just go to the toilet and then I just sit there and nothing is happening. 
<laughs> then just walk away. I mean, you should not be stressed about it. Try it another time. It works especially for kids who are going to school, and sometimes you don't want them to spend a lot of time in the in the you know in the toilets in school. And all. so if you train them, they actually it's like potty training. If you tell them in the morning go empty yourself, it becomes a habit. You can, but it's not something you should stress so much about because there's nothing special about emptying your bowel in the morning or in the evening. Just whenever it's convenient, wow. you because you can put things on hold a bit sometimes, but that's not good either. Yeah, but thank for you, a few thank hours. Thank you guys you so much for clarifying <laughs> that aspect. Let's get back to the Ugali Nation aspect. Let's talk about Ugali. Kate, as a clinical nutritionist, mm -hmm. are Kenyans <clears throat> cautious about what they eat, their nutritional diet? Um, I could say yes and no. Okay. Uh, we have a group of people who are very health conscious these days, and I, this is because of the increase in uh, lifestyle or degenerative diseases. You find that uh, it was not as common many years ago, but these days you may find some a, a famous person or your neighbor or your friend had something, something or something. So you find that with this, there are those that have actually deliberately started eating healthy. But the majority of us, I think, our lifestyles, waking up very early, you have to get into this traffic, so you skip your breakfast. There is not even time to prepare this breakfast. Guilty as you, charged. You find by 10 o'clock in the office, the only thing that was easy for you to take was a tea and a mandazi. Lunchtime, you only take the food that is available for you. Maybe it's fries that was the only thing that was near, a fast food that was near for you. If you're not able to pack your own food, you find in the evening you're home, you're tired. So what is the easiest meal that I'm supposed to take? Noodles. Yeah, you know, something that is within two minutes, it's ready. And it also depends, I think, on, uh, on our budget. Sometimes right. you find that I would have wanted to do a particular food, but I tell myself maybe this food would be for a Sunday mm -hmm. or a Saturday. But what fills us when it comes to the budget is that we do not plan. If you had maybe a two-week menu, where you're working with a two-week diet, you'd be able to work across that small uh, amount of money that you have if you do not have enough money to ensure that you're eating healthy throughout. Because majority of us and our mentality is that if you have to keep healthy, if you have to eat you know, all these nice foods, the fruits and vegetables, it has to be expensive. I think it is something in our mind. When you balance everything and you look at the foods that are sold out there, you decide you're going to reduce some of the junk food that is very expensive, replace maybe fries with spinach or repla replace them with maybe something like uh, a fruit. But are you're the able options, to balance it. Are the options there for Kenyans affordable? And I'm glad you brought it in the aspect of income and budget because for maybe the middle class and the upper class of Kenyans, that's, that, that works well for them. But imagine uh, a young person living in a low-income neighborhood and um, they're going to school or the university or they're just beginning their lives in their career industry you have a crazy lifestyle which you've also mentioned and painted it out for us can they be able to then use alternative um, options that are affordable and friendly to their pocket i think uh, personally i think uh those people, or, or if you, the, the, the person you're talking about will have the best lifestyle. Mm -hmm. This person may walk from their house to maybe the place of work. You are the person driving to your office. This person, maybe what is available for them to eat is the foods that are less fatty, less deep fried, foods that are easily available right. and foods that are more healthy. You find in the low income areas, there's a lot of markets. Mama there's a lot boga. of mama boga, yeah. there's a posho meal. So you go get the still same ugali we're talking about, but it will be whole, whole maize. You know the one that you just grill, uh, uh, you grind the maize when it's whole. And then as you're passing there, there's the fish that is sold in the omena, for example, and then you have your vegetables and foods, I think they eat, uh, they'll be eating more healthy. Right. The only problem would be if you do not know how to balance this food, mm -hmm. and that becomes a problem. So I you end up eating the same thing over and over and over again, but you reduce the uh, frequency or the amount of taking the unhealthy foods if you have a low budget because now the budget that you have works with what is there. But if you're a very busy person, let's assume your income is there and you have all this money, you become, let's talk about a bachelor. You'll be eating what is easy. You're walking home or you're on your way home, you just enter a fast food place and you buy just something to eat. It's only that we do not sit consciously and decide if you can be able to then 
I'll have a menu, I'll eat. The way you plan for everything else, we fail to plan for our health. Dr. Esther, we fail to plan for our health. <laughs> and I would add that uh, knowledge is power. Right. As you say, sometimes people have access to all these good, healthy foods, but they actually opt to go for the junk just because they don't know what it's going to, uh, to do to their health. Mm -hmm. Recently, our story was run in the standard newspaper about malnutrition. Mm. And it was actually the Ugali story that we have malnutrition either way. There are people who are lacking, like in the arid, semi-arid areas, whereby they are relying a lot on, on, on the maize and sometimes they, they, don't, they run out of supplies, so they are undernourished. They're not getting enough energy, they're not getting enough of the other nutrients. Mm. Whereas the, the, you know, the upper class, the middle class, the other people now struggling with the obesity. And you know, being obese and, and, or being overweight doesn't necessarily mean that you, you, you're consuming in excess. You could actually be consuming in excess of energy, but you're lacking in nutrients. Mm -hmm. And that is actually the problem. Some people actually have access to the right foods, but have the wrong attitudes or do not know the risk they are running and it's important to realize that what you put in your in, in your in your into your body has a lot of effects long term and it's con it, it's you know malnutrition actually it drains the economy. It will drain in the, the economy in the sense that once you get ill, maybe from a lifestyle disease, you'll be frequenting the hospitals, you'll be on uh, quite a number of drugs, you'll, you'll, you'll start being absent from work if you have to be admitted and all that. And this actually costs the economy, even at a personal level, even if you have your, you, you know, you're self-employed, you'll not have enough time to attend to your job. So actually, Health is your wealth. So people need to realize that whatever you're doing to your body, you're investing into your future. If you don't do things right, right now, in the coming days, you're going to be in trouble. Dr. Esther, we say that, like, that, that health is your wealth. Oh, yes. But, and, uh, but you know what Kate did? Kate painted for us the perfect lifestyle mm -hmm. of Kenyans, and also young Kenyans, because yes. Nairobians, Kenyans got places to be, things to do. You know? Oh, yes. So within that crazy, hectic lifestyle, and you trying to change your mindset and your mm -hmm. mentality towards how you eat and how you live, mm -hmm. how does one balance the same thing where you have to leave the house early to get to mm -hmm. your job, but then you've got to eat healthy? I think one thing you, we cannot underscore is actually planning. Okay. And like I said, if you realize that it's important, you're going to create time for it. You're very busy, but if you keep being that busy, too busy to plan for your health, you're actually going to drop dead as Ooh. you run around. Right. I mean, we've had people just seated, they're making good money, and they just drop dead out of a heart attack, something that's preventable. Mm. It's good to realize that most of the lifestyle diseases, up to 80% mm. or more, are actually preventable. Mm -hmm. And if you know what it is that you can do to prevent them, if you just decide, okay, I only have one free day over the weekend, go plan, write down that I need to stock my house in, with this kind of vegetables, with this kind of fruits, I need to buy this kind of grains uh, and that kind of stuff. Like, instead of focusing so much on the ugali, remember legumes have like our ndengus, our kamandes, and that is the, the, the lentils, the, the mug beans mm. and the other beans. They actually have carbohydrates as well. And this is a good kind of carbohydrate that comes with both soluble and insoluble fiber will have a bit of protein in it and that can actually keep you satiated for long so you don't keep you know craving to have lots of high you know calorie empty calorie kind of foods and, and that kind of stuff so it's important to to keep seeking that information that's why Kate and I are here yeah. to educate Kenyans that there's and something to add on to this sorry I uh, you know for us we think that uh, we only take make changes when it's too late Disease is a process. Mm. You only wake up when you look at the scale. You've added two kilos. That's when you start reacting. When when you start falling sick, that that's when you start reacting. Right. Yet you do not know that a lifestyle that you could be leading you, you're creating the disease from within. Every time before you attract something, your body has really worked hard. Honestly, all your organs, everything has tired, and that, that's where with time, it is a process that occurs with time. So if you build it from way before, you're actually able to balance it with time. Right. Kate, would you say our culture is something that has fed into bad habits. The reason why I ask this is that in places within the country, such as Kisumu, which is well known to be lovers of Ugali, uh, we know the Kipandas there in the morning at 11, as early as 8 a.m., Ugali is breakfast. But then again, you look at the sort of work that um, the people who go there eat is that they go, they're our construction workers. They need that sort of energy yeah. in the morning. Yes, so do. would you say our culture has played a heavy role in how we eat? I think our culture would contribute much more 
to our foods because we have a variety of foods that we can work with. Mm -hmm. But it's only because maybe from a certain area you find that the only easily available food is that ugali. Mm. So there, and there's no problem even having ugali for breakfast. In fact, having mm -hmm. a food in the morning is much better than having your tea and bread like mm -hmm. we always do. So this having <coughs> that meal of ugali in, that mo in the morning is okay. But we're talking about balancing it. You're taking this ugali with what and how frequent do you take this ugali? Are you taking all the time? I wish you could have this mentality that even if I'm going to have my ugali today and tomorrow, maybe the other day I'm having another type of starch or another different type of carbohydrate so that you have variety. And this will start all the way from not even as an individual, even the, the government, the counties to come and just start addressing the need to grow other nutrients, mm -hmm. other, other, other vegetables, other foods instead of just having ugali, ugali. Because Assuming we do not have maize, what ha what happens? They say that there is poverty. Yet you can grow potatoes, you can grow uh, uh, something yeah. else. You mm -hmm. can do something else. I think also education, so that uh, we are able to know that you can eat this food, but this other food can also help. And mm -hmm. if we take too much of this, maybe it's going to cause this with time. And especially to mothers, you know, with the uh, case she's talking about, the malnutrition article, there is even research that is saying right now we have stunted growth in our children. You know, they're not growing as they should. Their brain is smaller. And I think we need to address this thing as wholesome, not mm -hmm. just an item, the ugali aspect, but also a lot of things contributing to ensure that we are all eating well as a nation. Kate, I'm glad you brought in the aspect of the government. Listen to this, that um, on the study that, uh, that was done by Hivo. More than 50% of households in the country face food insecurity. I'm glad that you say that for the government, they can step in in terms of education. K uh, Dr. Esther, what more can the government do, given that food um, insecurity is one of Uhuru's big four agenda? As a nutritionist, as, a, as an expert in this industry, what would you love to see being done? Um, I think one thing, like from that story, we just realized there's a focus on the energy giving foods. And that's because uh, given the nature of what most people are doing that is manual, they actually need a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. And that's why ugali came to the fore. I think ugali is even less harmful as compared to the mandazis and the chapatis, a lot of white rice and, and pasta and all that. But that could not be highlighted because it's not commonly consumed. Mm. So what I would say probably the government would uh, advocate and run campaigns more to encourage people to, to venture into agriculture, make that possible for them and and very practical and affordable so we can diversify like some of the foods that do very well in semi-arid areas are actually like soga millet that seems to be are, are fairly neglected I, I would say but if we have this you know people venturing to more of this kind of farming of, of grains that can actually also have some good uh, shelf life then we we are going to be you know investing more into food security because the biggest challenge like it, it, it's it's a bit of a shame to be hearing mm. of of uh, undernutrition in this current era. Uh, as a nation, you know, when we have some people struggling with obesity, overweight, and others struggling with undernutrition, really something needs to be done. But it cannot be done at an individual level. It mm. still has to be done at a policy level. Something needs to change. I'm not certain what that is. But at, a, at personal level, at you know, in, back in the villages, people still need to be encouraged more to, to venture into subsistence farming or even commercial farming that, uh, for the ones who can do. And just diversify, you know, grow the, the, the Irish potatoes, grow the sweet potatoes, grow the yams, and, and just diversify our, our nutrition wow. to make it uh, you know, more interesting as, as well and not rely too much on me. Ladies, we'll leave it on that note. Thank you so much for helping us understand our nutrition as a nation. Dr. Esten Didi, she is a nutritionist as well as an author. Kate Kibara, she's a clinical nutritionist as well as a colon hydrotherapist. Michael, you've had that if you're having your gali with your nyama, it's still okay, but have it in doses and also have a healthy balanced meal. I, I thought you'd stop at that point, but it's okay. Uh, the but <laughs> is where the problem comes in. Having said that, I think it's important to highlight, <clears throat> excuse me, that planning your meals is important. Yeah. Uh, because I normally say, if you're not going to plan your health, then plan for a hospital visit. Mm. And I would rather that uh, I, I stop myself or control my feeding habits, rather than a doctor or a nutritionist tell me that from tomorrow, you cannot have your gali because it's overload and you have to control it. So I'd rather control it on my end and eat it in, you know, uh, reasonable portions. But there you go. It is definitely something to be concerned about. But also, 
Um, I don't know if uh, sugar is something that we've not handled and we're having a problem with sugar right now. Uh, maybe just very briefly your thoughts on sugar. Just Kate. Yes, in fact, uh, sugar, refined sugar, processed sugar, act, it's, it's like you're taking poison in your mm. system because it's only giving Before you, they even put the mercury and all yeah. Before yeah. all these stories that Long are there. Long before there's any mercury. Yes, it's already <laughs> taking nutrients from you. It's a nutrient robot. So I think if you could take the natural glucose, you take your sugar, uh, you take your honey, or use molasses, or use sugar, can. I think to replace this sugar, and I like the sugar story right now because a lot of things are also caused by taking sugar. Absolutely. So I think we need also to reduce or just... Yeah. So Zinzi, there you have it, validated that sugar could be a problem. And also I read that if it has mercury, by the way, and with these temperature changes that we're having, in case you feel funny, you are actually a thermometer oh right now. Oh my goodness. So. <laughs> you know what, a feedback, actually, from one of the tweets that I saw, one of our colleagues asked me today morning, how many teaspoons of mercury did you have? Oh, what? Mm. Anyway, the best way to to take sugar right now is just have your sugar cane and tea at the same time and uh, that might be a uh, way to do it but quickly through the question of the day today we're asking you the question what you'd like the media to highlight in regards to contraband what would you like the media to highlight in the contraband saga just to read some of your comments Elliot Nunu Silla says the most and worst corruption happens in the two houses media should now take this is from Samuel media should now take us to who imported the contraband sugar and what steps have been taken as to charge him in court uh, for all these tons of sugar. Isaac Mwenje says, uh, my family is confused. Is our sugar uh, potentially poisoned? If true, then the government hasn't taken enough steps. More action needs to be taken. Do you have tweets on your Yes, end? Innocent says the media should broadly put the names uh, and company involved and give facts about their involvement. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Keep the conversation going on online as we wind up the show now. It's 10 minutes to 9 and we want to hand over to News Centre which has got more news and reviews but from us right here on Morning Express from me, my name is Michael Gitonga. It's a wrap. Have yourselves a good day. God bless. And my name is Zinze Kibiko. See you tomorrow morning on Tech Thursday. We have an interesting conversation. Bye-bye for now.